But uh, I would say that we would start at the ferry building and walk all the way down to Matson. But if you came here 60 years ago, you would have found a new embarcadero or a different embarcadero, one that is absolutely unlike what you see here now. Across the street, you had the most two interesting blocks in the Embarcadero, and they were taken up with no, no bigger than a three-story hotel called the New Bridge Hotel, which was right in the center between Market and Mission. And that catered, all these little hotels, catered to the seamen that came in on hundreds of ships that came into San Francisco. Outside of that, you had restaurants, little coffee shops, uh, haberdashery places, uh, shoe shops, you know, every type of a shop that catered to seamen or to servicing longshoremen were located in these two blocks here. And so consequently, it made the place exciting because aside from these sh shops, about every fifth shop was a bar. And they boasted at one bar, I forget the name, it was Patty Ryan's Bar, whatever it is, which was the biggest bar supposed to have been in the world because it went from the Embarcadero straight right through to the next block and one long bar. And as far as the eye could see, that's all you saw was hundreds of glasses scooped up on a bar. So let me talk about the strike for a minute. The strike lasted some 83 days up and down the Pacific coast, from the coast to Canada, all the way down to the coast of Mexico. It started on July 31st, and uh, let's say it took in 1,900 miles. And it would involve something like 40 to 45,000 seamen, officers, longshoremen, harbor workers, tugboat men, even railroad workers got involved in it. From that strike, uh, six men would die. Two would be killed in Seattle, two be killed in uh, Los Angeles, San Pedro Harbor, and two would be killed shot in the back in San Francisco. Outside of that, martial law was declared. The National Guard brought in their army. Uh, they brought in tanks, their soup kitchens. Uh, they had machine guns up and down the waterfront. And after the shooting of these two men, the whole city went out on strike and shut down everything. We had conditions which were considered deplorable. They were below the standards that would be used any place. And uh, we called it the shape up. You came down here on the waterfront almost every morning. You're here at six or seven o'clock in the morning. They would shape up outside the pier anywhere between 7 and 7.30. And consequently, the way you've done it, you formed a big cycle. The rain, shine, or whatever. And the gang boss or the walking boss would come out and he'd hollow out, OK, I need about five gangs of men. And he'd start picking the men out. And it was always degrading when you come to think of it. And he would pick out. Charlie, come on in, Chuck, you know. Hey, Swede, you get in here. Hey, you with the big ears, come on in. And it was this type of stuff that went on over a period of years. And when he got his men, whatever, half a dozen, dozen, or 40 or 50 men he wanted, then he would say, the rest of you guys get the hell out of here. I don't need you. And so you just pulled your horns in, and you went to the next pier, hoping that you would get a job there if you got there in time. But there was, uh, when it comes to dealing with economics and somebody's bread and butter, all the corruption in the world starts to set in. And every gang boss found he could make a few more dollars by going through this process of making you beg for a job. So consequently, they'd open up a little whorehouse, they'd open up a gin mill, or they'd open up a little flop house. And long as you were seen going into these places by the boss, that meant that next day or a couple of days later, 
you are good for a job because certainly he's going to cater to the people that's making money for him and he'd pick you out oh come on in and he'd bring you in and go to work and you also want you in a pier you had to work like a dog anyway probably more than the other guy uh, so this went on and it formed this type of corruption where men begin to stick two toothpicks in their hat uh, hoping that the boss would see it and that meant that you were willing to pay two dollars back on your wages that day or else you would get the brass they gave you a brass with a number on it and instead of coming to the paymaster to cash the brass at the end of the day you went to the boss's gin mill and you cashed the brass over the bar that meant that you were spending the money in his bar so there's corruption just nothing but corruption 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 on the job there's no condition you could put five loads of a five ton of cargo on a ship you could do almost anything on the swim on the load maybe the boom would fall on top of you so who cares there's a hundred other men willing to step over you and take your place for that day so it was very bad from a point of labor condition, economic condition, and everything else. So it was these type of things that festered in the guy's soul. Consequently, this type of thing is brewing you and brewing you, and finally something has to be bold. You cannot take these type of conditions for long until you pick up a sledgehammer and start running amok in the street. And this is probably what was getting ready to happen in San Francisco here. The men needed a union. They didn't have any. We had a union. It was called the Blue Book Union, a company union, which meant no meetings. You couldn't talk about condition. You couldn't talk about nothing. But you had to belong to that Blue Book. And so the strike is now on. Every single longshoreman on the Pacific Coast is now out on strike, thousands of them. Along comes the seamen, who also have these type of barbaric conditions. And they say, well, if the longshoremen can go on strike and fight for conditions, we're up against the same pack of tyrants. We ought to join with them. This is a good time. And so they started to walk off the ships by the hundred. And every single ship came in, seamen had their bags packed, ready to come down the gangway. So that's, now we have a legitimate strike up and down the Pacific Coast involving more than 50,000 men. Every single longshoreman, every single seaman from San Diego all the way up to the coast of Canada is now off the ship. Ships are laying out in the bay here by the dozen. No cargo, they can't move. All the firemen, sailors are off the ship. So now we're going to go down here a few feet and meet the first confrontation that the strikers in San Francisco have with the police department, who is determined that in 24 hours they could clean up this waterfront, send the men back to work. And so consequently, we're going to see what happens a few feet from now, OK? The reason for this spot here that I picked because this is where the first confrontation with San Francisco's, San Francisco's police department and the strikers took place. From the other end, a picket line was formed, and at least a 1,000 men start marching up very slow. First guy had the American flag. He thought that, like we all do, present the American flag, and it's a doorway to everything. He found out differently like we all found out. But we come marching up, and the police department had something like 15 vans of cops. You could not see them. They were closed in a van. They had them up this street, up the other street, and even as far as Mission Street. So consequently, the police walked across the street, and they met the first batch of pickets. And they said, what the hell is all of this? Don't you know you cannot pick it? Do you have a permit? And a striker says, we don't need a permit. You have to have a permit to parade or demonstrate or pick it. 